For the inverse of a function to exist, the function must be 1 to 1 and onto. Now, you could just write this down, and that would get you the marks, or the mark, I should say, but it's important to, to understand what these mean. So, 1 to 1 means that every element in the domain of the function maps to uniquely one element in the range. So that's one to one, and on to means that every element in the range is mapped onto. Now if you study further, and you may have been, this may have been mentioned in your lessons, but a one-to-one -one mapping is called injective, and an onto mapping is called surjective, and if it's one-to-one -one and onto, that's called bijective. So, for the inverse to exist, a mapping must be bijective. And so, you could write that as your answer to part i. For part ii, f applied to f to the minus 1 of x means that we're going that way with f, and we're going that way with f to the minus 1. So if we're applying f to the minus 1 first, so we're actually going this way and then that way, we get back to where we started. So that means that f of f to the minus 1 of x is just x. b part i runs nicely on from part a because if we want to suggest a domain for G so that the inverse exists, we simply have to find a domain on which G is bijective. And a good way of looking at this is, uh, you don't have to sketch it necessarily, but if we sketch uh, the function x squared minus 1, so it's like that, and it crosses over at minus 1 there. So what we can't have is an x value that maps onto the curve where another x value also maps onto the curve because that means it's not one-to-one -one or injective. So to define our domain we could choose just the positive arm of the quadratic there. Sorry about my terrible drawing. Or we could choose the negative arm. So the positive arm is from naught to infinity and the negative arm is from minus infinity to naught, and notice we could have a square bracket or a round bracket there. And of course we actually could take any subset of that. So we could just have the domain being a particular value, 1, let's say. Or we could have it between 1 and 3, and we could choose whether to include the 3 or, or the 1 or not and so on. And similarly for the other branch. Um, the answer they're probably most likely to be looking for would be this one, or for cheeky students, 
that one. But actually, any of those would be acceptable. So I'm going to go for the standard answer of naught up to infinity for part one. Now for part two, for myself, I would do a sketch of H, just so I can have a look at it. And um, we've got e to the x plus one, so that means we've got an e to the x sort of curve. Um, but it's raised above the axis by one, so the asymptote or the line which the negative end of this graph tends towards is at one. So that's what H looks like. And H is of course mapping an X value here, so that's our X value, onto a Y value. Now what h to the minus 1 does, so that's the path of h of x, but what h to the minus 1 does is goes from a y value onto an x value. So that's our h to the minus 1. So for part 2, what we can do is to start off by thinking about what the red one does and then undo it. So we have that uh, h of x, which we're going to call y, is e to the x plus 1. And effectively what we're doing when we do the inverse is we are swapping the x's and the y's. So So if we write this as x equals e to the y plus 1, that actually is defining h to the minus 1. But we now need to get it in the form y equals. So we'll take away 1 from both sides. Then we'll do the natural log of both sides, write them the other way around. And since log of e to the y is equal to y, then that gives us y equals log of x minus 1. And so we can say h to the minus 1 of x is log of x minus 1. Now for the sketch, um, I think the one I've already done is a bit too messy to, to put the new curve onto. So we'll do a, a new one. So we know the asymptote for h is along there at 1. And since, and you may or may not put this line, draw this line on, but I think it's helpful. So that's the y equals x line. The inverse function is a reflection. And that means that the inverse function will have an asymptote where x is equal to 1. So we put 1 on there as well. And then we can see that the h of x goes along here, crossing at 2. And the inverse is a nice reflection, also crossing at 2 on the x-axis. And we should label them, of course. So that's h of x, and that's h to the minus 1 of x. Now, for part three, which I'm going to squeeze in here, we want g of h of x. So g h of x equals g of h of x. So that's g of e to the x plus 1, which is therefore e to the x plus 1 squared take away 1. Now it does say in its simplest form and we can see that when we square this out so e to the x squared is e to the 2x then we get two lots of e to the x then we have our plus 1 
a minus 1. And because we can see that when we square that, we're going to get a plus 1, and that will therefore cancel with the minus 1, then that is therefore our simplest form. Some might argue and say that we should take an e to the x out. So we could say that's e to the x times e to the x plus 2, which does have some advantages in the interpretation, but either of those is acceptable. Just a little note to add on at the end, a little error of mine having checked it, is that this h to the minus 1 of x that I wrote here should say, of course, x to the minus 1 of y. And that ties back into part 2 because when we're changing to h to the minus 1 of x, we are reflecting it, which is why we swap everything round, swap the x's and y's round at the beginning.